Good evening, good evening. I know some of you are going to catch the replay and many of you have to log in, but do me a favor. As soon as you come in, start leaving comments to let me know that you guys can see me. Let me know that y'all are in here. I'm not expecting a huge, huge, huge turnout today, but I'm I'm going to be excited for everybody that shows up because this is not one of those topics that everybody um, crowds around, but it is something that we all need to crowd around. It is something that we all need to discuss. Hey, hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm always happy to see y'all uh, leaving the comments and everything. I'm excited, guys. I'm excited to talk to y'all. I know it's been a minute. I have been really, 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 really busy. Um but I did want to take the time out uh, today. I've been planning all of last week and all of this week to come out and talk to you guys. Hey, hey, hey. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to have to kind of force it one day. I'm going to have to force it one day. I got this Amazon gift card. I didn't know I had. I got to check this out and see if this thing is still active. I just found an Amazon gift card for $10. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get ready to get started. Um, so first and foremost, hello to everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, today, I wanted to come out and just have a discussion with you guys uh, about object objectification. Uh, I want to talk about everything. I just want us to have a an open discussion. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit. I don't have any notes before me. This is coming from my heart. So I'm not, you know, reading from any notes or what have you. Um, I do want you guys to do me a favor. Make sure that you're liking this. If you have not subscribed, make sure that you take the time out to subscribe to this channel and also take the time out to share it. So if you haven't liked it, uh, I would love for you guys to go ahead and make sure that you are uh, liking the video so that, you know, I see your support and all that. So anyhow, I wanted to deal with this topic. You guys know what's going on and I know that um, you probably heard about it so many times. And for a lot of us, it's like, OK, um, we've heard it so much that we're trying to unplug from it. And, you know, I can be honest with you guys. I can be transparent. A lot of times when, it, you know, dealing with subjects like this, I tend to kind of stray away because, it you know, it frustrates me. Um, so I want to give this testimony for those of you who don't know. And I think the majority of you do know um, if you go to. Google and you type in the name Mannix, M-A-N-N-I-X Franklin, you will pull up a story. And this is a story, you will find three Mannix Franklins. Um, this is a story of my uncle, my mother's brother. He was killed in 2003 by a cop. And of course the cop was a white guy. My uncle, what had happened was him and his wife had got into an argument. I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but they got into an argument and what have you. She called the cops on him. Um, he had come home intoxicated or what have you because they were having problems. So long story short, she called the cops on him. He went outside. He hid behind. Um, he went into a neighbor's yard, I'm thinking, and he hid behind some cars. I always said it was a trash can, but it was a car. But he hid behind some cars. And what ended up happening was when the cops came, they saw him. They called him out from behind the cars. He came out from behind the cars. Now, my uncle was the type of person that, and I don't know if he had his hands in his pockets, but according to the cop, he had his hands in his pocket. Um, and so, and they said, according to the cop, they, they told him to, or the cop told him to remove his hands from his pockets, but he didn't. And according to the cop, he was advancing toward him. Now, that's the cop story. Now, if you were to know my uncle, you would know that he was a very gentle guy. He was a very... A uh, subtle, sweet, gentle guy. He wasn't an aggressive type guy. He was not, he, out of all his brothers and sisters, he was a quiet one that sat in the corner. But long story short, you know, alcohol, of course, we can say, well, we don't know how alcohol had him acting. I've seen him with alcohol. It only made him more mellow. Um, but long story short, um, the cop opened fire on my uncle and took his life. And that was in 2003. And since then, I have been really passionate on this racism war because the thing about it is this same cop ended up getting in some more trouble. Just like um, this cop that killed George Floyd, 
he has a history of hurt, hurting black people. He has a history of it. He has a history of abusing his power against black people. And since then, I've been really, you know, relatively mellow about it because I think, I believe like this, God gives us the opportunity to time. There's a window of time where God's going to allow, you know, me and everybody that he's called to deal with racism to, you know, to deal with that, you know, but there's a time and a place for everything. So I don't necessarily like, I don't come out with the you know, trying to, to to fight up against it as heavy. Maybe I should go a little bit heavier, but I don't come out as heavy right now because I'm. For me, I would rather have a solution in place. I would rather have something in place before I came out. So anytime I see you know racism coming across my screen, a lot of times I'm very reluctant to read the article, and I definitely don't watch the video. I cannot watch the video of somebody losing their life. Um, because me, I don't want that to impact my heart in a negative way. A lot of people, you know, they have that type of, uh, you know, where they can, that type of heart where they can watch that. But I think that a lot of times, you know, watching stuff like that is good to educate yourself. It's good to see, to be aware. Um, but you have to know your own heart and what that would do to your heart. And so for me, I've seen the images of, um, this cop, you know, um, pinning George Floyd down. I've seen the images of his eyes open. I've seen the images of his eyes closed. I've read articles about it. And it is absolutely heart-wrenching. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And a lot of times what we're doing, you know, and I'm not just talking to us as African-Americans. I'm talking to us as a people. A lot of times our mistake is that we try to deal with fire with fire. We try to fight everything uh, we try to fight a demon in the flesh. So the Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal and we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers and against the rulers of this dark world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And a lot of times it's very easy for us. I want I want you guys to hear some stuff and I'm going to say some stuff to you tonight that is going to probably, you know, it's going to kind of open your eyes. I want you to hear something. I want you to understand a demonic agenda. This is how demons work. When a demonic spirit wants to inhabit a person, it has to use that person to access another person. It needs a bridge. This person who has a demonic spirit is a medium. They are a medium. They are the middle ground between um, that spirit um, and the kingdom of hell and whoever they come in contact with. So if I'm dealing with somebody who has a spirit of rage, if I get in a relationship with somebody who has a spirit of rage, the spirit of rage is going to want to enter me. And the way that the spirit of rage will enter me or would try to get into me is by using that person to constantly, repeatedly enrage me. And every time I calm down, every time I get a little, bo a little bit of hope, every time I get excited about our relationship, every time I think things are turning for the better, that person would disappoint me because what that spirit does is it would allow a scab to come on the wound. But as soon as that scab gets there and I start feeling like, man, you know what? We've been through hell together, but our relationship has gotten a lot better. You know, I'm glad I stuck in here. Then that person would disappoint me again and hurt me again and again and again. Eventually what happened, what would happen is I would pick up that spirit of rage. And so that spirit of rage Whenever a, a demon is in a person, is going to use that person as a medium to access other people. So let's deal with this spirit of murder. I want to deal with, we're going to deal with objectification. Of course, I want you guys to understand objectification. If you have not shared this, share it on your social media. Listen, there are a lot of people who can benefit from this, especially right now. But when it comes to a demonic spirit of murder, let me show you how this works. When you're dealing with a demonic spirit of murder, what it does is it uses this guy. For example, we've seen the pictures of him with the uh, hat on talking about um, make America white again. We, so we clearly see that he's a racist and we see these images or what have you. So the enemy is strategic. And I, I just want you all to hear this. The enemy is very strategic. The enemy will put this guy in all these positions, wearing his hat. I have him to go all of these different places and do all of these little racist things. There are going to be other things that come out about him. 
And then all of a sudden, what the enemy, enemy will do is at the height of it, the enemy will cause him or just like what the enemy did, cause him to take a person's life. And while in that moment, while he's in the process of taking that person's life, he's objectifying a human being, which is what he's already been doing. He's always been doing. He's objectifying a human being. He doesn't care that there are cameras around because it's a demonic agenda. That spirit in that moment is climaxing in his life. This is the end of his assignment. The, what he did was he ripped off the scab. And every time American blacks, anytime we're trying to heal, that demon comes and rips off the scab. It is the spirit of murder. I'm going to call it what it is. It is the spirit of hatred. It is the spirit of murder. And so what it does is we see this image of this guy. We see him. And then we have this other guy that went jogging and, you know, he gets killed. We see all of these racist images. And what does it do to our hearts? It hurts. It angers us. You know, when this happened, I found myself normally I'm able to kind of ignore a lot of that stuff. Not so much as ignore it, but I'm, I'm always telling myself the time will come for you to deal with that but just not right now. So when, you know, there are images of people getting killed, you know, videos and stuff, I, I just don't watch it because I don't want that to do anything to my heart. But for this, even though I didn't watch the video, I saw the pictures. When I tell you it broke my heart some type of bad, I found myself in the kitchen crying like a baby. It broke my heart some type of bad because to see so much hatred that is spewing out in this country, to see all of this spewing out in this country, so much racism and so much division, so much denial. So tonight I'm going to get some followers and I'm probably going to get some unfollowers. Tonight I'm going to speak to some stuff because I believe that the only way that we're going to change is if we take this cotton candy out of our tails and we stop with this taboo foolishness where I can't say this because it hurts people's feelings or I can't say that because, you know, it's going to make people know. When it comes to this type of stuff, you have to understand how that spirit works. So let's deal with this. I'm, I'm going to say some stuff and y'all just got to know my heart. Um, make sure you're liking this and make sure you're sharing it. The way that that worked is now everybody's hurt. The, wet, the scab has been ripped off. All of us are hurt. We are hurting. And most of us, you know, if you're African-American, you feel the pain the most. If you happen to, if you're Caucasian, you, you know, you, you can feel it. You can probably sense a little bit of it, but you may not necessarily be able to wholeheartedly relate. And being able to uh, not not being able to relate can cause you to come off as insensitive to the matter. And so as an African-American at this moment, many of us are extremely hurt. It's not even a like it's not even a small hurt this time, because like I said, for me, it completely just shattered my heart. And it, it, I, I found myself one day the next day after that, I really couldn't even get out of my bed. I just felt the pressure of it. It was just like this. It was almost like an elephant sitting on my chest, you know, because I'm thinking about this man. What, is, what about his family? What about all of this? Just because some guy had hate in his heart, just because some guy just, you know, that was something that um, he'd always wanted to do. And he just needed an opportunity, a legal outing to do that, you know. And so when it comes to that type of stuff, the enemy has done what he wanted to do. He ripped off the scab. Um, and just, you know, he just constantly ripping that wound right back open. Um, and this is a wound that has not closed. This is a wound that has not healed yet with us. And so he just constantly ripping it right back open. Let me tell you why. Because the spirit of murder is trying to enter. You know why? The enemy wants bloodshed between blacks and, and whites. The enemy wants bloodshed. And so let me talk about this. So let me show you what the enemy is doing now. Now you have protesters and you have looters who are in all these different cities and states and stuff like that, you have a lot of um, white people who have uh, prejudice against blacks. They have this preconceived notion that blacks are thugs, that blacks are, you know, just food stamps, welfare, government cheese, always trying to get over the lazy, just want to steal stuff and what have you. So you have these looters who are actually feeding into that, 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 that perception because you have people out there who are, peaceful pro protesters who are trying to do it the right way, then you have looters who use that as a cover. They use that as an opportunity to come out. They don't give a hoot about George Floyd. 
Those looters, some of them, now I'm not going to say all of them because some of them are people who are genuinely angry who don't necessarily know what to do with their pain. They don't know what to do with their anger and that's how they respond to anger. And so, but you do have a lot of people who are opportunists, who are coming out right now. They're using this as an opportunity to go out there and steal. It, that's all. They're using this and the media is so demonically racist that you know what they're going to do? They're going to come and they're not going to show the white ones, they're going to show the black. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I, I'm from Mississippi and I know this stuff. They're not going to show the white ones that are out there doing or uh, busting windows or what have you. I mean, they may show it by default, but for the most part, they're going to feed into a, a an already preconceived notion about black folks. So what that does is it ignites the racist guy who's at home and he's like, we got to start this clan stuff back up. These Negroes are getting out of hand and it causes them to come out and they hurt another black person. And then now we have more black people that have come out. And the next thing you know, we have a white, uh, white and black war. It is freaking flesh, people. It is flesh. It, this is what this is. But and, and when it comes to racism, I want to help you to understand when it comes to the flesh. Anytime you don't have the spirit of God, you are animalistic in nature. When you don't have the spirit of God, you're animal, animalistic. If you don't know anything about animals, you should go to a zoo. You should study. You should get, come to understand a little bit. Animals are territorial. So if you're dealing with a racist white or a racist black, they're going to be animalistic. What's going to happen is that racist white feels like this is my country. And you Negroes need to get out of it. All you Latinos, all of you non-whites, y'all need to get out of my country. Y'all need to go. I don't care what happened to you. You know, just go back over there to Africa, what have you. That's going to be, that's the heart of the racist white. The racist white wants to see you gone. The racist white has objectified you. You're nothing but an object. And when it comes to the racist black, the racist black sees the racist white. And he sees what the racist white person is doing. He also sees um, the whites that have it good, you know, are very privileged and what have you have. You know, life has been easy for them. They've never had to deal with the stress and the struggles that we've had to deal with. And so the enemy, again, will highlight those things to create a race war. He'll highlight those things to create a race war. Now, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on that point. I want to deal with objectification real quick. Um, I want to help you all to understand how objectification um, works. The word objectification, the root word of objectification is object. So God said in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. They will be despisers of, of others, but they're going to be lovers of themselves. We are living in the last days. When it comes to objectification, it is exactly what a serial killer does. Objectification is looking at a living thing as an object. That's all. It means to take away the personality. There's no intimacy. You don't not you. So you have to you have to have your dealings with that person has to be done through a preconceived notion about that person or a preconceived notion about their group. That's the way objectification works. The enemy is very strategic. So if I objectify, for example, uh, Oriental people, if I was to objectify Asians. Um, let's just say Chinese, you know, if I was to objectify Chinese, then what would happen is I would have a preconceived notion about them. I would say, oh, they just do this, 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 and that. And every time I saw one of them doing it, it would feed into my objectification of them. It would take away my ability to love them as a people, because to me, they would be objects. Now, what God wants us to do is to unify, meaning I need to have some Asian friends. I need to have some people around me that I can, you know, kind of talk to. And so I can see their world. I can see their perspective. I can see them for where they are and who they are. That's what helps me to love them. That's what helps me to say, oh, no, you know, and I can help pull down prejudices. But what the enemy does is he encourages division and clicks. He encourages all of these things. Um, hey, Brother Daniel, how are you? He encourages all of these things so that. We only surround ourselves with people who look like us. We surround ourselves with people who are like us. We surround ourselves with people that we can relate to. We only want to get around people that, you know, like we want to be in, in, just in a room where we can talk and ha ha and laugh and high five rather than sitting in a room that forces us to listen. So when dealing with the race is white, I want to say this. 
when dealing with, you know, racism. There's racism in just about, I mean, I'm not going to say just about, in every race, you're going to see racism. There are going to be people that have levels of racism. You guys know I like to deal with spectrums. You'll have somebody who's 10% racist, 5% racist, somebody who's 60% racist, somebody who's 80% racist. You're going to see a spectrum. Um, racism is just ignorance, you know, just in a nutshell. It's, a, it's just ignorance. So it's just this person, whereas what they don't know about you, they fill in the blanks. And they fill in the blanks based on what they were told, the images that the media perpetuates, um, and, you know, just even from their friends or what have you, they fill in the blanks. And so if I was a, a white kid, for example, and I'm around nothing but white kids, and they say, oh, there's a, a black guy. Oh, you better watch it. Make sure you hold on to your wallet. That will that will cause me to start thinking a certain way about black people. So by na by nature, instinctively, I will begin to grip my wallet. I begin to grip everything anytime a black person comes around because I've been taught that. If I, if my parents perpetuated that, I would be even worse. Same thing in a black household. So I'm saying all of that to say that the remedy for this is love, but you can't get love without information. I want y'all to hear me on that. You cannot and you will not get love without information. What does that mean? It means that if you as a white person or you as a black person don't take the time out to get to know the other race, then guess what's going to happen? Racism. Racism. And I want to I want to kill this lie. I want to kill this concept that if you have black friends that you're not racist. I want to kill it. Um, I was sharing with um, a, a friend of mine yesterday that, excuse me, a story of mine from elementary. I used, I used to be friends with this girl, a white girl. You know, I, my mom, thank God, was never racist. My mom brought us up to be very diverse. So when I was in elementary, I had this friend, you know, she was my best friend. We sat together. We hung together. We fought together. Blonde hair, blue eyed girl. We and we, uh, she slept over to my house. I, I never got a chance to sleep over to her house. What have you? Long story short, while we went to elementary, you know, there was no racism there, or it was maybe a uh, light level or what have you. She ended up um, transferring to another school, and that was fifth grade. She ended up transferring to another school. In the seventh grade, I ended up transferring to that same school. I didn't know anybody at this school and I happened to see her. Now, I didn't have her new number or anything like that. I happened to see her and immediately I got excited because that's that was my friend. You know, I was like, hey, hey, and I saw her. And when I came over and I spoke to her, she made it very clear that she didn't want to have anything to do with me. By this time, she was surrounding herself with women who looked like her. Now, the school was diverse. It was 50% uh, white, 50% black or maybe 60% black and 40% white, but she surrounded herself with other white people. And I walked up and I was like, hey, and I started talking to her, she was like, hey, and she walked off. And it was surprising to me because this is somebody that stayed the night in my house. This was my best friend. I fought over this girl. We used to hang out all the time. She introduced my mom talking about mom, this is my best friend in the whole wide world. And to see, you know, what, uh, what difference can happen in less than two years was uh, amazing to me. So I sat there and, you know, I was like, okay, I didn't want to believe she was brushing me off, but I had to accept it because anytime I went around her, you know, she would just be like, so she made it very clear. She didn't want me around her. Um, one particular day we were in math class, algebra class, and this is seventh grade. We were in algebra class. And while we were in algebra class, our teacher, you know, had, uh, she said, okay, I want everybody to give me your phone number. Um, she was trying to update her records and what have you. So she had us shouting our phone number across the classroom, which was unorthodox because, you know, most people, you know, a lot of kids, you couldn't, they couldn't get phone calls and stuff like that. So, you know, it, I remember it striking me because normally, you know, if a teacher wanted your phone number, they'll call you up to the desk. But this teacher, she was just mean. She was just like, hey, shout your number out. So if I call your name, I want you to say your phone number. So this particular friend of mine or former friend of mine, she said her phone number. And I made a joke. I said, oh, got your number. And she said, you better not call me. And that stuck in my mind. She was like, you better not call me. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I had to come to understand what it was. The 
people that she was hanging around, they were more pro-white. They were more, you know, preppy. We don't deal with black people. We'll ha hello to you, but we don't deal with black people type. And she was afraid of her image being tarnished by hanging with me. And that had that was not my first brush with racism. But I came to understand racism because I came to understand that on a spectrum, people, racism is learned. It's ignorance, but it's also learned. But on a spectrum, people have levels of, of racism. So I was sharing with the sister in Christ yesterday that, you know, when I saw that girl by the time, you know, some years later, you know, she was being super nice to me. And she was like, we got to hang out or what have you, because by that time I was doing really well and everything. And I was just looking at her like, yeah, no, another girl in high school, uh, junior high, we were really close friends. You know, my uh, clique in high school, it was a mixture of it was. Um, let's see. four whites and four blacks. That was my click in high school. It was four whites and four blacks. Let me see. I think it was three blacks. Three or four blacks. That was my click in high school. And well, junior high. And one of the girls, she was, you know, real cool, real down to earth or what have you. And I remember seeing her some years later after we graduated. And she was acting really, really funny with me. Um, you know, I saw her and I, I walked up and I saw her and she was hanging around those preppy girls that she didn't like. Um, you know, when I saw her, she was around some preppy girls. And so she felt like she couldn't deal with me because she was around some preppy girls. I'm saying all that to say that you have to be mindful of your associations because a lot of time you get around people that you want their acceptance. And I'm, I'm speaking to my white sisters and brothers. You want their acceptance, but you know they don't necessarily deal with blacks like that because it tarnishes their image. I would admonish you to get away from them. You, we, we have to get to the point. Racism is going to end. It has to end on both sides, but it has a, it has a first start. And I'm gonna say this: it has a first start with whites because racism. When people, when we were bought over to this country, our ancestors were bought over to this country. They were oppressed, and we've dealt with racism history, you know, just time after time, year after year, decade after decade, our parents, and I hate to say this, our grandparents, our great grandparents, they raised us with PTSD. They had PTSD when they were raising us. They were traumatized when they were raising us. And the only way that we're going to be able to, to really deal with that thing is there has to be, and I'm, I'm talking to, for those of you, you, you know, you're my white sisters and brothers, you have to get to the point where you have to say something. You cannot surround yourself with other whites who feel like you're not allowed to say anything because then they're like, oh, I'm so sorry that you feel that way, such and such. You know, um, they're, they're trying to force you to have a perspective in order for you to fit in. Baby, hear me when I say this. You have to stand out. Otherwise, our country is going to go up in flames because what's going to end up happening is there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. Why? Just because there are a lot of people who won't open their mouths. There are a lot of people who are worried about their images. They're worried about, well, I don't want to come out on my page and say, I don't want to come out on social media and say, I denounce racism. And I think that that's what's going to be a powerful movement. I can see those videos where people, you know, whites are coming out and even blacks coming out and saying, I denounce racism. I am not partnering with racism. I had a guy um, I had a guy that came and I was married at the time and my ex had him. We had invited, we had got hired at a car dealership and I've shared this story with you guys before, but, uh, we got hired at this car dealership and there, one of the managers there, um, we invited him to our house to play a game, a game of spade. Um, he came and he was a white guy. He came over to our house and my ex had invited one of his friends over to our house to play spades with, um, play spades with us, what have you. Um, so to play spades with them, because I didn't play the spades. I was just cooking, what have you, while they sat down and played spades. But one of the things I remember was that my ex's friend, he came over and it turned out he was racist. And I didn't know that. My ex didn't know that. And he kept making, he was really rude to the white guy. He was really rude. He kept making, he was just like, just play, just play. Then he kept making little comments to my ex like, you better be lucky. I like you, man. You better be lucky. You, you know, what have you? I was so infuriated. And so was my ex. We were both so infuriated to the point where I told him, I said, don't you, don't you ever 
allow that ignorant, ignorant dude back in my house again. The thing that was stupid for me was that the white guy, uh, he he was a manager. The the two be, the two people we invited over were unemployed. They were looking for jobs and they couldn't get hired nowhere. The, it was a husband and wife. They could not get hired anywhere. And it was like, dude, literally playing cards, play your cards right. Come here, just be nice. Have a good time. Don't let racism enter your heart. But he was really rude to the guy, what have you. And we apologized to the guy. You know, um, we were just like, so sorry, didn't know that, what have you. Him and his wife stayed unemployed. We re-invited the guy, the manager, back over to our house maybe a week later. You know, and this time we invited two more friends who happened to be unemployed. We were in our 20s, what have you. Uh, two more friends who happened, it was a boyfriend-girlfriend duo. We invited them over. And they were super nice. They came, they played cards, they laughed. And guess what? By the time that guy left, they both had jobs. When he was talking to them, they played, they talked their smack at the spade table. He played, you know, he was one of those guys that, you know, he had that little kind of hip hop attitude, but he played spades and, you know, they laughed and talked when it was done. He told him, he was like, um, you know, where y'all working at? And they said they didn't have any jobs. He was like, well, come down to the dealership. This guy was going to take us out on his yacht. We went down to the Mississippi River in Arkansas. We had to drive across the bridge, but his yacht um, didn't work. When we got in, he had the yacht, but it didn't work. Um, it was something wrong with his yacht, so we never got a chance to go out on it. We ended up getting um, laid off, not his doing, because I think that man, as a matter of fact, he quit because the dealership had laid off uh, so many people. I'm saying that to say that racism is dealt with when somebody says something. My ex and myself, we said something to the guy in our house. Like, no, you're not going to do that. We don't, we don't tolerate that kind of stuff in this house. Like, I don't know who you think this is, where you thought you think you are. And, it, you know, we made it clear that's not acceptable. So I'm saying to my white brothers and sisters, make sure you get to the point where you say, when you see that or with people around you, you say something. You, you got to understand that you are the majority. African-Americans are the minority. And so a lot of times what has to happen, I want you to think of it from this concept. If there are people screaming, if you got 350,000 people in the room and then there are 2,000 over here and the 350,000 are yelling, you can't hear the 2,000. So it takes somebody that's in the, in the majority to actually begin to speak so that you can increase the sound of the minority. What we have to do is increase the sound of Jesus Christ, the love of God on this earth. We have to increase the sound of the love of God, because if not, what's going to happen is the enemy is going to continue to divide this country and we're going to end up becoming a third world country. He's going to continue to divide this country. This, our economy is not doing well. We're already dealing with Corona. We're already dealing with so much. The enemy has a plan. And the crazy thing is many of us are so blind that we can't see beyond black and white. We can't see beyond color and culture. We're so busy. We're so caught up in, oh my gosh, your culture is different than mine. Get around. One of the greatest things that, you know, uh, I regret doing this, making the mistakes I made in life. But one of the things that I am grateful for that I learned in those mistakes, like me marrying that African guy, it blessed my heart. Do you, I want to tell y'all something. I have such a heart for people in Africa now. I absolutely adore that's, and that's that came from me, not from him, but from the Africans that I was around, not just Africans from Cameroon, which is where he was from. But I met so many different people from Africa. I met so many different people from different countries in Africa, and it opened my heart. And that's what happens when you get around people that are not like you, even though you don't agree, even though you don't necessarily understand Um their ways of thinking or their culture it opens your heart that's what's called love god wants to open our heart for love but if you if you reserve yourself and you only get around people that look like you you shut yourself off and what what happens is because you have no relationships with people outside of your color or outside of your culture there's going to be a void in that area there's going to be ignorance Wherever there's ignorance, you're going to fill in the blanks yourself. Wherever there's ignorance. And if you're dealing with objectification, you're going to objectify. 
All of us have been guilty of objectifying, of objectification. All of us. You know, I was thinking about this today. I was thinking about how when, um, and I'll be transparent. You know, I, I had an issue like my neighbor. You know, I was getting really frustrated with a lot of the things that was happening with my neighbors and stuff like that at one point. And I remember looking at the guy because, you know, knowing he's doing all this stupid stuff. I was like, I'm living in a nice neighborhood. It's quiet over here. Then I get these new neighbors and they're problematic. And objectification. Now, I'm an African-American. These are African-Americans. Objectification hit my heart. I started looking at him and I'm going to use a term that kept popping up in my head. Transparency is what exposes the devil. Cockroach. I was like, man, I hate when cockroaches come and, you know, they just kind of ruin everything. I started and God had to deal with me about that. He had to deal with me about that. That's not how you think about people. Because I was like, this guy, you know, he, he, got, he got problems. He got issues. And I'll be over like dealing with that. I ain't paying this, this amount of rent and coming to this nice area to have to turn around and deal with that. Why my people can't live in a nice area and, act, you know, and God had to deal with me about, about that. He was like, you know, no, that's a person. That's a broken person. There is a difference between a broken person and a bad person. I want somebody to write that in the chat room because somebody's going to come here and they're going to scroll this chat. There is a difference between a broken person and a bad person. And God had to educate me. A broken person is a person that chances are they were raised with a lack of information. That's the poverty. Poverty has nothing to do with money and manifesting money. Poverty means a lack of information. That's all poverty is. It's a lack of information. If you have people who are uh, objectified or, or, or living in a, a, you know, in an urban area, what have you, and the schools are you know, not that good and they're lacking information and the parents, you know, generation, they didn't have that much information, then you're going to have a person who had, who is broken. You're going to have a person who has a lot of voice. Thank you um, for everybody that wrote that in the, in the chat. But you're going to have a person who has a lot of voids. Those voids are created from ignorance. Those voids are the product, the product of ignorance. Meaning it's not that the person is a bad person. They just don't know no better. They don't know any better. And so what are they going to do? Fill in the blanks over there. Where, whatever they don't know, they don't know. Whenever you're dealing with a void, I want to help you to understand. A void means lack of substance. Whenever you're dealing with a void, this is what the enemy likes to do. That area of you is going to be... I'm trying to see if this would be a good example, but I don't think so. The, um, we'll, we'll, we'll use this water. It'd be tougher for me to push this part than it is for me to push this part because this has substance. This has water in it. Now, I want you to imagine a solid sub substance in here because water is not the best example. But I want you to imagine, you know, some little baby rocks up in here. It wouldn't be easy for me to push this in because I have substance. And rocks are per the perfect example because they've solidified. They're hard. That means they're set. One of the things is like I get the word of God and then I harden, I set right there. That means I'm impenetrable. That means that the enemy can't come and tell me a bunch of lies because it's just like I'm already set. You know, when it comes to that, and we call that setting your ways when you're setting the wrong thing. So if this was filled with rocks, it would be harder to push here. But up here where there's air, it would be a lot more easier to push. So what the enemy does is when he sees substance, he doesn't bother. He's going to go for the area where there is no substance and he's going to create a dent. That's an impact. That's called trauma. Did y'all hear that? He's going to create a dent called trauma in the soul. So when the enemy sees in every area of your life, there's going to be an amount of substance. There's either going to be ignorance or wisdom, ignorance or knowledge. When the enemy sees now knowledge, I want you to understand knowledge without understanding is information that has not solidified. Knowledge without understanding is information that has not solidified, meaning it's still like liquid form. So it's still kind of pressable. If I can, I can educate a person and give them a bunch of knowledge. It's not until you believe it that it goes into the third level of your heart. It's not until you believe it until it starts to harden, until it rests as information. It solidifies and becomes. And then that's when you can draw from it. You can't draw from it until it becomes understanding. You can't draw from it until it becomes understanding. So this is what the enemy is. What do you do? If he sees knowledge, now he'll bring somebody to come along that gives me facts. 
I love this. I love this. If the enemy sees knowledge and it has not solidified, he's going to send somebody to bring me facts. So my, somebody come up with a false religion and say, well, you know, as a black woman, you know that this, and they can give me a bunch of facts. And I can get deceived easily because I have a bunch of knowledge and I'm interested in the knowledge, but none of it is really ever solidified. But if I take the knowledge that God has given me and I study and show myself approved, I get understanding and then it solidifies in my belly. So now it's hard. When somebody comes up to me with a false religion, I'm not going to fall for it because that information is solidified. So the enemy doesn't mind you getting knowledge. Right now I'm giving you knowledge. But it's what you do with this knowledge that's going to determine whether it impacts your life or not. Is You have to take this knowledge and study and build upon it and allow it to solidify in your belly. And when it solidifies, you're able to draw from it. When it becomes understanding, you're able to draw from it. You're able to benefit from it. There are a lot of people who have a bunch of knowledge, but they have no understanding. A lot of people can drop facts on you. I used to, jo I used to joke. Um, I used to joke around about, you know, like when you see people who are full of knowledge, but no understanding. When you see them on camera, they wear the glasses. They kind of lean back in their seat. My glasses are upstairs. They lean back in their seat. So you'll see them on the news, on an interview, and they'll do stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Keep talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full of knowledge, no understanding. And it's very easy to get attracted to that because what they say to you, you'll be like, man, dang, I didn't know that. It's just knowledge. But it's the spirit of God that turns that knowledge into wisdom. You got to get understanding from it. And whenever you take that understanding and you begin to move it in your life, you begin to exercise it. It becomes wisdom because now I'm taking it back in and recycling it and I'm extracting more and more from it. That's when it becomes wisdom. But trauma, the enemy will traumatize you where there is knowledge because it's not solidified. Where there's understanding, he can't fool with you. But where there is nothing, where there is nothing, trauma. Easy. Easy trauma. If you never learned about races, if you never studied in that area, easy trauma. Because there is nothing there. He can put a dent right there really easy. There is nothing there. And so what the enemy likes to do is he likes to promote the, the concept of race, you know, or um, even relationships, you know, we'll deal with that in a little bit, but he likes to promote the idea that people are bad. And like I said, I, I know I was going somewhere. Um, I was looking at this guy like, oh my gosh, you know, cockroach, you know, they, these are the type of people that come. And, you know, not because he was black like me, but because he was the type of black that even us blacks don't want to be around. You know, us that are trying to work and trying to have a decent life. You know, it's just like, I don't feel like this thugged out stuff. Like, don't bring that stuff over here. But then God had to rebuke me. God had to rebuke me. God had to educate me. God had to, you know, tell me, hey, listen, don't think like that. Because there's a difference between a bad person and an uninformed person. If the person has been lacking information their whole life and they're only doing what they know how to do, that's a broken person. That's a broken person. Broken people, there's hope for them. Broken people, all they need is an edu edu education. They just need a different experience. They need to get around something. They got to have something else to look up to. I'm an example of a person that was broken. And what God did was I was surrounded by ignorance. I was surrounded by trauma, perversion, and a lot of that my whole life. But what God did, and I love how beautiful he is. I love how great he is. What God did was he allowed me to go. And I told you guys when I was working at uh, Walmart, I ended up having this manager that was 24 years old that was a virgin who was Christian. He allowed me to see what I could become. And, you know, I couldn't go back and be a virgin again, but I could be saved and, you know, God can restore you and all that. We know that. But he allowed me to see something different. So my little ignorant self saw something different in this woman and I admired it and I watched her. That's the power of you becoming an example. She never sat there and said, let me mentor you, Tiffany. She never said, Tiffany, let me educate you. No. What she did was she just walked around and she lived her life. She was an example. And I went to her and I would ask a ton of questions. But when you're dealing with a, a person, a bad person, a bad person is a person who knows better but chooses wrong. That's a bad person. A bad person is a person who knows better, but they choose to do wrong anyhow. Why? Because hatred, they're angry with God, or they, they feel like they're entitled to this or they're entitled to that. 
there's a difference between the two. And if you don't know the difference, you will find yourself guilty of objectification. And if you find yourself guilty of objectification, then what's going to end up happening is you will look at people and you will see objects. You'll start thinking the way I thought that when I saw that guy. And God, when I tell you, I love, I love how God rebuked me. I'm not one of those people that get mad about being rebuked. I'm, I'm grateful when I'm rebuked. I'm grateful. And the reason I'm grateful is because it gives me an opportunity to grow. It gives me an opportunity to become a better person. It gives me an opportunity to break, you know, to put my, uh, to break that gener generational curse all the more. It's new information. It's new information. So I had to learn to look at people from a different perspective. To look at folks, because sometimes even as black, we objectify each other. Come on, let's be for real. We objectify each other. Sometimes as black, we'll look at a person and we be like, lock my car door. And I'm not even against that because I do that with all races. You know, if you look questionable to me, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna try to prove a point just to make you feel better by not locking my door. If I, thankfully, my car, you know, the door is automatically locked once I crank it up. But if my door, you know, well, not once I crank it up, once I turn and start driving, what have you, if it don't do that and you look questionable, yeah, I will have locked. I don't care what color you are. I've done that with white, black, Latino. It don't matter. It doesn't matter what color you are. If you look questionable and you're walking a little bit too close to my car, I'm going to make sure I will double check. And I'm not caring about your feelings. Why? Because I, I ain't trying to, I ain't going to prove a point to you. I'm not going to sit there to prove that, you know, I'm not prejudging you or what have you. No, I don't know you to prejudge you. I'm protecting myself. This has nothing to do with you. This is me protecting myself. You'll get over that. You'll get over that. So this is my clarion call. This is my clarion call to my black sisters and brothers, to my white sisters and brothers, to my Latino sisters and brothers, to my Asian sisters and brothers. Love each other. Fight for each other. Because if I see a bunch of blacks about to harm a white person, I will intervene. I will jump in there and say no. And I'll get in front of that guy and be like, no, y'all ain't gonna do that. Y'all got to do the same, regardless of the race. And you got, y'all, I'm going to tell you how to get up in this thing called life. Because the crazy part is, I, I gave this story, like I told you, the girl in high school. Here's my, here's my testimony. Here's what I've learned. This is what I've seen. The people who spend all of their time trying to impress other people just so they can fit in, they don't go very far. Financially, they don't go very far. They don't go very far. They get the chance to fit in. But when you fit in, you got to understand, fitting in doesn't necessarily mean that you're accepted. Fitting in means that you're fitting into somebody's void. It means that you're fitting into a spot that, where the person has accepted you. That's all. You have to lose your identity to fit in. And I'm going to tell you guys, I'm a complete jerk when it comes to that. I ain't trying to fit in. For me, I like to be able to stretch my legs and be Tiffany. I got to be who I am. That's why I'm not one of those people that come out. And I'm, you know, uh, black, all this. No, I'm not that type of person. I'm that type of person where I want to love all God's people. I love all God's people, regardless of your color, regardless of where you come from, regardless of your economic status. I love all God's people. I love all God's creatures. If I find something in my heart that should not be there, I take the responsibility to clean that crap out of there. I take the responsibility to pray about that. I take the responsibility to admit to God, hey, God, this is in my heart. I've had times as an African-American that I have struggled where I felt racism trying to come, come, come against me. If I saw a lot of whites doing a lot of stuff to blacks, I can feel that hate. I can feel hate trying to get in my heart. I can feel it. And I have to push it back and say, Satan, I don't want you. I renounce you. Hatred, go in the name of Jesus. There is There are good blacks and there are good whites. There are bad blacks. There are bad whites. There are good and bad in every race. But the good in every race need to speak louder than the bad because it's the bad who's the loudest. The loud, the bad will sit up and do all types of ignorant stuff. And you know what's sad and what's scary to me is the thought that some good cops are going to get hurt. They're going to get hurt because they happen to be white. Some good cops are going to get hurt just because of a bad cop. You know, if you got parents that are racist, Y'all hear me when I say this. You have the responsibility, the moral, the spiritual responsibility to call him out on it. Mom, I don't agree with your stance. That's hatred. 
that. I don't agree with your stance. That's hatred. And I'm not going to let you educate. I'm not going to let you teach that to my children. If my parents were racist and I had kids, they could not keep my kids. You ain't going to put that crap in my kids. You're not going to teach that to my children. You got to have the, you got to take the stand. And if you don't take the stand to do anything, you're going to answer for that at some point. Because you're so concerned with fitting in and not standing out and not wanting to be confrontational or have somebody to disappoint. I, I posted something to my page. And let me see. I posted something to my page and it's not even remotely racist. And um, a girl shared it. Let me see. A girl shared it. Um, and when she shared it, some guy came to her page. Now, I'm assuming, you know, um, well, I know she's white. He came to her page and he was like, I'm sorry you feel that way. I happen, I usually don't look at the shares, but I just so happen to look at the shares on that. And he's like, I'm sorry you feel that way where there are some good cops and what have you. What he was doing was trying to force her to take a side on a race war. And it's like, I'm not even dealing with this whole thing of, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, oh, this, you know, I, I'm standing over here saying black power. No, I'm over here literally just, I'm over here just teaching. Give me a second. Let me see if I can find his post. But what the short end of it is what I'm saying is he's, you know, sometimes people will try to make you choose a side when you don't have to. The only side you got to choose is right um, versus wrong. So here's the post. It's relative. No, it's not too long. I cannot watch a video of someone being brutally murdered. It takes me to a dark place, especially since my uncle Max Franklin was murdered by a racist cop in 2003. Every time history repeats itself, I, rem I am reminded of the day. When I received the news that my unarmed uncle, un, my unarmed uncle had been shot multiple times by some bloodthirsty racist cop. That cop was later arrested for attacking another black guy. He had a lot of issues on his record. Racism is a system. It's more than just a trigger happy Klansman who traded his white dress for a blue uniform. It's a system. And it is. A system is nothing but a widely accepted mindset that draws its power from a source. The source of racism isn't hatred, it's ignorance. Ignorance is the root, hatred is one of its fruits. Our problem is we keep going after the fruit, but we aren't addressing the root. If you mow the lawns, the weeds will grow back, but if you attack it at the root, you've eradicated the problem. I'm silently contemplating, thinking of a solution, a system, or something I can propose to someone somewhere. I've said this since the day my uncle lost his life. It is dangerous to have cops serving black people from a white perspective. And I think that's where he probably took um, offense. They need to be sent into black communities to volunteer before they are hit, handed a badge. Power without love or empathy is a recipe for abuse of power. But let's put our heads together, black, white, Latino, and Asian, and build systems to eradicate ignorance. This is how we pull down the strong man of, of hatred. Now, let me explain this. When I said, for example, um, it is dangerous to have white cops serving black communities from a white perspective. What I mean is that we have completely two different cultures and we can be honest. There is a lot of um, notions or um, preconceived notions in both cultures. And a lot of a lot of whites that were raised in areas where there were no blacks, they were raised with preconceived notions. The same thing we did when it comes to like Africa. We had preconceived notions. Right. We had this idea that, you know, a lot of people in Africa were naked sitting on the ground and they didn't have no food. And, you know, and it wasn't until we got around them and found out, no, Africa is actually, you know, it, you got a lot of third world countries um, there, but some of the richest people are in Africa. Like the richest of richest people are in Africa. But, and it's not like, you know, you, you can go into villages and see, you know, um, people who are living like that. But, you know, the media uh, strategically just shows you, you know, uh, people sitting on the ground naked or what have you, and people in tribes. The media strategically shows you that. But this is what happens if a white cop who, who lives in a white area and he's never been around blacks, he can have preconceived notions, which will lead to fear. Ignorance always leads to fear. It can lead to fear. So if he sees a black man and a black man looks hard, what have you, he looks thuggish, you know, because of where he was raised, he can have a preconceived notion. And if he draws his weapon, he can react too fast because he fears what he sees. He, he thinks that you're going to hurt me. You're going to do something to me. So he, he can fear. And for him, 
he will fire off at that guy. He's firing off at his fear. He'll fire off at that guy and he'll shoot that guy for no reason just because he was fearful of him. That's his ignorance on display. That's what I mean by put. And so that wasn't the point of that. The point of it was, you know, when you're uh, sharing stuff like that, a lot of time. Yeah, I'll deal with that in a second. But a lot of time when you're sharing stuff like that, you have to be careful that some people on your page, they will intentionally, they don't want to understand. They will intentionally try to misinterpret that. There is nothing about that that's racist at all. But they will intentionally, because they've already picked a side, they've already decided that it's a race war within their hearts, even though they don't tell themselves the truth. They are, they've already decided that there's a race war and they've already picked a side that, okay, I'm a white guy, so I'm a white. So you got to automatically, as a white woman, as a white man, you got to automatically be on this side. No, you don't pick a side on a race war. You pick the side of Christ Jesus. You don't pick the side of flesh. You pick the side of love. That's the way you fight a race war. You don't come up and say, oh, this way, you, you, you fight. You fight on the side of love. That means that if I see blacks doing something bad, I address blacks. If I see whites doing something bad, I address whites. And as for my, my white sisters and brothers, you have to do the same. If somebody's around you and they start talking ignorant, address it. Address it. Because at the end of the day, we got to stand before God. This life is temporary. And I don't want to stand before God talking about, well, you know, I didn't want to disappoint people. So I just kept my mouth shut. I didn't want to hurt people. You know, I didn't want my family to be upset. They'd be like, oh, my gosh. You know, I didn't want them to look at and I know the weight. I know the weight of people's opinions. The opinions of people are heavy. They're really heavy, especially if you're weak. The, the weight of people's opinions and wanting to be accepted. If you really want to be accepted by God, you have to accept being rejected by man. I don't know who wants to hear that, who needs to hear that. If you want to be accepted by God, you have to take the chance to be rejected by man. I have to do that with the African-American race at times. You know, if, if the large majority of African-Americans are saying something I don't agree with, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and be like, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I'm not going to do that. If I don't agree with it, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it. That's just the way it is. I'm not going to sit up there and say, well, just because, you know, most African-Americans are no, no, I have to stand there and say, nah, I don't agree. I, listen, I'm sorry. I know you, you pro this and you pro that, but I don't, I don't agree with that. I'm sorry because it's not a flesh thing. We're not warned against flesh and blood. Flesh is not going to glory in the presence of God. And ain't going to hell for nobody. Ain't going to hell for nobody. Ain't going to hell trying to prove no point. I'm, I'm going before God saying, Lord, I love your people. I'm going before God saying, God, you know, I stood on the side of righteousness, not on the side of flesh. Not on the side just because we're culturally different. That's what makes us so beautiful, guys. It's the fact that we're different. You know, when I was in high school, and then I'm going to deal with this on the... Uh, but when I was in high school, having, you know, mixed friends, you know, having, uh, like I said, having this clique that was uh, multiracial, it was beautiful. It killed a lot of potential ignorance and not just me, but in them because they were free to touch my hair and I was free to touch theirs. You know, my black friends, uh, we, we were a mixed group. Our white friends were playing our hair sometimes. They'd be like, your hair is just different. Oh, my gosh. Will you do that? And we were able to try our racist jokes on each other. We were able to do crazy stuff within a safe setting without getting offended. You know what? They can say stuff. And, you know, every once in a while, they'll say something. And we just like, you pushing it, you know, and we can joke about that type of stuff. And we can sit up there and they'd be like, your hair feels like this. And, you know, we joke, we like, we won't get no insects in our head. And they didn't get offended. We didn't get offended. We would laugh about that stuff because we were dealing with racial uh, preconceptions in a safe place. We were dealing with that in a safe place. We could laugh. I remember one of the jokes that we used to laugh about was that, you know, I remember we talked about relationships or what have you. I remember this joke and we were in junior high, but we, one of my friends asked like, I don't know if it was me or somebody, but I remember what we were like, Hey, why can't you break up with a, a white guy without ending up in the trunk of his car being backed up into a river? They don't let you go, man. They'll kill you. You know, and we were joking about that. And, you know, the our white friends, they were laughing about it. Like, not all. And we were just like, yeah, every time you look on the news, some guy, like, 
you, you can't break up with him. He, he'd be up in the car in front of your house eating pork and beans out of a can, you know, crying and he'll back you into the river. He's like, you're not going to leave me. And we cracked up about that. We can do that in a safe space. That's what happens when you love people. And listen, and you can't love people without defending them. You can't love them without defending them. You can't because there will come a time when you will feel like you have to choose. There will come, listen, there will come a time that I can be in a room and there's seven blacks and there are two whites and the blacks can be wrong. And even though the majority in that room are black and the blacks can be wrong, I have to take the chance and say, well, no, I agree with them. I got to take the chance to say that in order for me to say, no, y'all wrong. That's how you eradicate racism. You don't eradicate racism by saying, well, I'm just going to stay neutral. I'm going to stay neutral. I don't want to say anything because I don't want, no. Open your mouth and spare not. That's how you come against it. Open your mouth and spare not. You open your mouth and say, no, that's not right. I'm sorry, guys. I can't get behind that. When God sees that he can trust you with a voice, he'll give you a voice. When God sees that he can trust you with a voice, he will give you a voice. You, I'm, I'm not just talking about the ability to speak. There are so many people speaking. They're speaking foolishness all over social media. So many people that have the ability to speak, but what they're saying makes no sense. And what they do, people who have no voice, I, I, got, I did a post about this today. People who have no voice, they'll come to social media and, for example, they'll attack pastors. I see stupid stuff coming up on my social media, on my page every day. People attacking pastors because they have no voice. Because they have no voice. So they try to create a voice for themselves by sounding loud and ignorant and saying stupid stuff that a lot of hurt people can uh, ascribe to. Because people see that as boldness when they're ignorant. When they have no substance, they see that as boldness. When they have no revelation, when they don't understand honor, they see that as boldness. So people come in like the status. And they build a platform for themselves by attacking God's bride. The church is God's bride. They build a platform for themselves. That's not a voice. Because if I got to go to hell just so, just so I can get a couple of likes on social media, the devil is a lie. I'm going to defend God's bride. I'm going to defend God's people. Whether they be black, white, Latino, or Asian. I got your back, but I need you to have mine as well. I got your back, but you got to have mine. You got to have mine. And I want to deal with this because sometimes racism is subtle. It's not always somebody saying, I don't like black people. You know, I, I said, you can be white and you can be black and have white and black friends and still be racist. I, I learned that from having white friends. You can still be racist, meaning you can be around white uh, blacks or you can be around whites and you still have preconceived notions. You can still do that. That doesn't mean that you're not racist. If you're sitting up and you're supporting people who are racist, you are partially racist yourself. On that spectrum, you may not be 80% or you may not be 90% racist, but you're, you're on that spectrum over there. And that's what this is what we need to be doing in this life is taking ourselves and moving that spectrum over toward love. I want to be like God. God is love. I want to be like Christ. So I'm constantly moving this spectrum, even when it's not popular to do so. So if you're sitting up and you're supporting even candidates that are clearly racist, you have to check yourself. You got to check yourself. You have to look at things from different perspectives. You can't look at things from the perspective that benefits you. You have to look at it from a perspective where how can we benefit as a country, as a whole, even on my social media page, I see people and I'm like, a little racist self. And they're like, oh my God, Tiffany, I love you. No, you don't. You need to get, you, you still dealing with racism. It's still in you. And you got to deal with that. And I'm not just talking about whites, I'm talking about blacks too. Racism. But I deal with it when I see it. I don't sit up there and act like, you, you can't be a friend of mine and be racist. You just can't, black or white, you can't be a friend of mine and be racist because as soon as I see it, I'm going to shoot it. As soon as I see it, I'm going to say something to you. As soon as I see it, I'm going to educate you over there. I'm going to say something to you. And you got to be willing to have some people in your life that will cut you in that area. Because you got to answer for it. 
So if I got an answer for it, I'd rather have somebody to tell me, Tiffany, you're a little bit racist. Really? And to point it out to me. And if I see it, I'm going to be like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I, I'm so sorry. Lord, I repent. Take that out of me. Let me get a book and educate myself so I don't be like that. Let me go get around some people who don't look like me, who don't sound like me, so I don't be like that. I want us to stop with this objectification of humans, people, just because God used a different color paintbrush when he painted them. God is magnificent in all of his wisdom. Nobody he created is ugly except in the heart. Nobody he created is it is a, a failure, failure, except, you know, they serve the enemy. Everybody God created is a masterpiece because he's the master. Regardless of how you look, regardless of whether you're culturally accepted or not, everybody God created is a masterpiece. Everybody God God created is beautiful in his sight. And, you know, I just ordered, um, and it's supposed to come tomorrow, some canvases. I want to get into painting. Y'all want to see me up here? Prayerfully, this one doesn't flop because I got an idea. I ordered some canvases. Now, to me, as the artist, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go get, I'm gonna go down to Michael's and get some paint, and I'm, a, I want to do, you know, some canvases in my room. I want to hang them up, and I figured, hey, if I do a really good job at this, I'm gonna keep practicing at it, and I'll start selling them, you know. But I'm not when I, if I start selling canvases. Whenever I start selling paint, I got some ideas to make it unique. I ain't selling none for no twenty four ninety nine. I'm sorry. No, I'm gonna come out and act like I'm Michelangelo. You know, I'm gonna come out and act like I'm Michelangelo because I'm gonna go in. But it, when I paint something, when I put it together, whether it is attractive to you or not, to me, I may be proud of it. Somebody who is a master painter may look at it and say, oh, that's, that's okay. But I'm proud of it. When God looks at you, he sees a masterpiece. He sees a work of art, something he's proud of. When people look at you in a culture, and if the culture says that you're not beautiful, even as an African-American, in the African-American community, we know that there are certain features that are not necessarily acceptable. And, you know, and that goes from region to region. But we know that there are certain features that are not necessarily um, accepted. You know, and so you can be considered unattractive um, if you have certain features in certain regions or what have you. It depends on what region you're in. Um, that's true in Africa as well. Um, in Africa, you know, different regions, there are going to be different features, you know, um, Africans are able to look at each other and know what country or take a wild guess and say, oh, he's from Ghana or she's from Senegal. They're able to look at features, even though in America, you know, when we look at people, we just like, OK, oh, you know, we may look at somebody and say, OK, I think he's from Africa based on, you know, because we'll see the strong cheekbones and stuff like that. And we'll say, OK, I think he's from Africa um, and stuff like that. But when it comes to God, God looks and he sees a masterpiece that he's created. He sees something that he's painted and it's being rejected. It's being rejected by people. It's being rejected. And God is looking and saying, if you only knew the treasure that's in it. You know, a lot of us, the things that we want, it's not, we, it's in us. But the way that God activates it is, I just had this out. When God wants to activate an anointing, Sometimes he plugs us up. I just tried to plug this in the wrong end. He plugs us to the right people. So some of the things that you've been asking God for, they're in you. You just haven't connected to the right people yet. So as soon as you get plugged in, you get powered up. And some of those people don't look like you. I believe that a lot of people die broke because they surround themselves with people that look like them and sound like them their whole lives. They do everything. They stay broke. They stay when the people that God wants to connect you to this right here is a note nine, uh, note nine plus I think Samsung note nine plus they laugh. They laugh at me because I don't know what this, this is the note nine plus nine plus whatever. It has a very unique core. Most chargers don't fit into this. You're the same way. Not everybody fits into your life. But you know what we do out of ignorance? We surround ourselves with people who look like us that don't fit into our lives just because they look like us. Just because we are familiar with the culture. 
you know, as a part of the culture we grew up in, we do that. Not allowing ourselves to get out and do something absolutely crazy. To be around people who don't look like us, don't sound like us, who could potentially have what we've been, we've been looking for. You've been praying. You've been asking God, God, where, you know, I, Lord, I want, I want to get, I want that money, that million dollars because I can feel it. How many of you, by show of hands on here, can feel millions of dollars in your belly? Like you can sense it there. You know it's there. You sense it. You just don't know how to pull it out. By show of hands. How many times, amen, we reject the masterpiece ourselves. How many times you can sense that, you can sense it in you. Show of hands. I'll wait till I see the show of hands. I see one person that is responding because I know we got more people on here. I know we ain't got all, everybody on here ain't broke. Ain't broke mind. Everybody on here ain't. How many people can sense it? Amen. I'm looking for two more people because I, I know. Amen. 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 That's what I'm talking about. Your What's in you is, is, is powered up through your connection. You may not realize that it's powered through who you're connected to and how you're connected to them. If you connect in the wrong way, you can't get any power. I just ordered this today, found out I don't even need it. I thought this was something I can plug into my computer and it would allow me to plug multiple things in. But as it turns out, this is for like a, a desktop, I mean a laptop or something like that. It's really disappointing. <laughs> it was really disappointing. Um, but it does have this where I can plug this in. So that works there. But right here, I can't plug it in. You see that? Different type. This is what we do with our lives. We try to force connections because people look like us. They sound like us. Um, you know, we, we try to force the connection. Um, and we spend the, we spend all of our lives doing this when sometimes the people that God wants us to connect to don't look like us. They're from different countries. And I genuinely wholeheartedly know this. I, I don't just believe it. I know this. If you connect to the right people in the right season, a blessing is inevitable. Who's going to type that in the chat room? If you connect to the right people in the right season, a blessing is inevitable. If you connect to the right people in the right season, a blessing is inevitable. The secret to wealth is not working your tell-off. I used to think it was working my tell-off, you know, just building everything. No, the secret to wealth ain't that. The secret to wealth is called honor. It's called love. It's called forgiveness. It's called, listen, empathy. It's called loving your brother and your sister as you love yourself. Loving God with your whole heart. It's called getting information. That's the secret to wealth. Thank you, thank you. If you connect to the right people in the right season, a blessing is inevitable. If you connect to the right people in the right way, if you know whenever you connect to people, for example, if I connect to somebody, I want to be spiritually sensitive in regards to that person. I don't want to just be connected. I don't want to just be sitting up there thinking of uh, how it's going to benefit me. No, I want to, if I connect to the right person, my thoughts are, what can I do? How can I be a blessing? You connect to the right people in the right way. A blessing is inevitable. A lot of people, God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. A lot of people will go to their grave broke. You know why? Because they surround themselves with people who look like them. I'll give you this. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about relationships. I don't too much want to go into relationships because I think that we need to just kind of uh, deal with that. But because I said I was going to deal with it, uh, I do have some things. I'll do, deal with some questions. So we'll deal with the relationship thing under the question segment. But I remember my ex. My ex, he, he was from Cameroon. He had a relative who was from Cameroon that had been living in America for like nine years. He came to America and his accent was a thousand times better than hers. His accent, it was easier to understand him and it was easier for him to understand you. She could not understand, even though she had been here for nine years. She couldn't understand. Let me tell you why. She was going to Cameroonian meetings. She moved in, She moved around Cameroonians. She did not allow herself to mingle with Americans, even though she was an American. 
she surrounded herself with nothing but Cameroonians. Her whole world was Cameroon, even though she was an American. And it was difficult to understand her. She didn't understand the culture. She didn't understand anything. She couldn't keep a job because she was offending people. He came, and because he got around Americans, he of course he was with me. He got all his thing was he learned and he spoke really good English. So his his accent was even different from hers. It was completely and utterly different. You are who you surround yourself with. If you want to la learn the language of a people, and I'm not saying that, oh, you got to start, you know, you got to start acting like folk. I am one of the people, I'm one of the most anti-act like you folks that you could ever meet. I'm one of those people that I believe in being myself. Like, I don't believe in doing stuff just because other folks are doing it. I'm just not that person. I I'll just go ahead and be labeled as weird. But I still like to get around people and learn. I still like to get around people and, and educate myself and I so I can pull down the stereotypes and the prejudices and the fears, not just in myself, but in that person. You know, I like to get around people and learn. And when you get around people, you find out why they do what they do and why they think the way they think, and they find out a lot about you. So I'm saying all of this to say, and I'm going to wrap it up with this whole thing, and then I'm gonna deal, we'll deal a little bit about relationships. I'm saying all this to say, when it comes to this whole George Ford thing, Floyd thing, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to either come together and you're going to have to encourage folks to come together. You can't just be like, okay, I'll just take the social media and say, I, you know, no, you have to make sure that you're, you're holding the people around you accountable. Whites, you got to hold the people around you accountable. Blacks, you got to hold the people around you accountable. Now you're going to see a lot of racism. Remember I said that the enemy is getting, what he's doing is he's trying to get the spirit of murder um, into a lot of blacks. And, you know, a lot of blacks have wrestled with it or what have you. Um, and if I can be transparent, if I can be, uh, well, not forget that I can be transparent. When it comes to the black race, we have generational curses. There are things that we struggle with. In the white race, there are generational curses. You know, there are things that it is not on the, on the whole white race and it's not on the whole black race. But there are things that are prevalent in the white race. There are things that are prevalent in the black race. I know that from being around whites. I know that from being a black one. There are things that are present uh, that are prevalent with Latinos. There are things that are prevalent with uh, Asians. In every race, there are things that are very, very uh, prevalent. Um, in the African American community, we know what, what we struggle with or what have you. And sometimes we get annoyed with it. We get annoyed with people that you know, especially perpetuate stereotypes. Um, in white America, one of the strong men has been murdered. If we deal with that strong man, if we call it out, see, if I sit up here and try to be nice and pretend that I don't know that, then if that's something in you or in your blood, you pass it to your children and you don't know it. And in the African American, we see murder coming over. We it's a lot of murder enough. But can I hit can I hit my brothers and sisters, my African American brothers and sisters? You know what's in our blood? You want to know what's in our blood? Can you handle the truth? Give me three likes and I'll tell you this truth. Three more likes. I need three more people to like this. When I see the three likes come, I'm going to tell you the truth. There we go. Slavery. You know, let, me, let me show you why. Slavery is prevalent in us. I'm going to show you something. When our ancestors were in Africa, they held each other in slavery before the white man came over and got whatever you do to other people, whatever you, whatever is prevalent is what you're going to suffer with. A lot of blacks were holding blacks. They sold, what happened was they were selling blacks to, to white Americans. They were holding folks in slavery. So now that's a generational curse. Slavery is prevalent in the African American. And so that's the reason why it's so easy for us to be a slave to a system. And it's, it's starting to become prevalent in white America too, because you know, we're mixing and mingling. But that's so that's the reason why we're so easy to become uh, dependent. We can, it's easy for us to become slaves to a system. 
slavery is prevalent and it's in our blood. Witchcraft is in our blood. White America blood, uh, murders in your blood. You, and the way that you eradicate that is you educate yourself. You admit that is there. And you say, hey, listen, that's why my uncle didn't like to grab a lot of guns and shoot Kenyans. You know, that is in the blood. But you deal with that by educating yourself and admitting that that's something that's a struggle. You don't deal with that by defending your race. You don't deal with that by defending your race. Because what you're doing, you're not defending your race, you're defending a demon. Do you want to hear it? You're defending a demon. And that demon don't love you. That demon don't care nothing about you. I'm a, I'll call stuff out of my race and we got to all be able to call stuff out in our own races. You got to be able to look at your race and say what's in there. You got to be able to look at your race and see what's, say what's in there. We have to all, as African Americans, we got to say slavery is in our blood. It's in our blood. We're quick to become slaves to something. And that's the reason why when you're educated about that, when you know that it's easy for you not to be a slave anymore. When you know that, when you, when you admit something, it's easy for you to walk away from it. When you don't admit it, you walk in blindness. You're like, la, 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 la. no, 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 not me. No, because I knew that was in my blood, whenever I was jobless, when my ex and I lost our jobs, when he said, hey, let's go get food stamps, I said, uh-uh. No, because I knew I can mess around, go down here, that's in my family. That's slavery, guys. When you rely on the system to take care of you, it's slavery. You want me to explain to you why? Because if I rely on the system, the system is going to put me in a ghetto. It's going to lock me up in an area, give me a small little allowance, and I'm the only piece that I have is that I ain't got to work. For, I ain't got to work. I get to sleep in and wake up, but I got to deal with men who have a slave mentality. I got to deal with so much. I got to deal. I got to be. I got to be. Caught up in this little area, I can't travel. I can't do nothing. I gotta worry about my worry about my house getting broken too. It's slave to a system. I said no to it. I said I don't want it. No, he said Tiff, why? I said because I want us to be hungry. I told him that. I said I want us to be hungry because if we hungry, we'll get a job. We won't sit in this house. I knew it was in his blood and it was in my blood. I knew, looking at my family, if we went and got them food stamps, we probably wouldn't want to work because we wouldn't want the stress. We would have been at home like, this ain't so bad after all. No, I didn't want that. Just like you, I felt that million dollars bubbling up on the inside of me. And just, unlike my relatives, my predecessors, I'm not, I'm not one to think that the million dollars is going to fall out of the sky. I'm not one of those people that's going to come into a grocery store because I feel the million dollars and I can't find it and fall on the floor and then think that's going to be my meal ticket. I'm going a, I'm to a call out ignorance. I don't care because I love people enough to say we got to stop this. This is how you break out of it. You got to come. You got to come out of it. You have to call it out. Whites, you got to call out your demons. Blacks, you got to call out your demons. Latinos, you got to call out your demons. Asians, you got to call out your demons. You got to call it out. You got to call it out. When you identify it, you'll be the first in your family to walk out of it. When you identify it, you'll be the first in your family to walk out of it, to get free. And then your family will follow suit. When you identify a demon that's in your family, oh, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to give you a scripture that's going to bless your life. Give me a second. Proverbs 6.34, This is a deliverance concept. This was a law, but it's also a deliverance principle. Men do not, men do not despise a thief if he still to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. If he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. When a demon is found, when you locate it, he has to restore everything he stole from your family. When a demon has been found, some of y'all were on the deliverance and you have seen a breakthrough in your finances. You've seen it. 
when a devil has been found, he has to restore sevenfold what he took from your family. Everything he took, he has to restore it. Because a demon don't just come there and live. He come to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He don't just come there and chill and act up whenever, oh. No, he comes to steal. He comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. But a thief, let me find where I was. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. I'm trying to find every demon that's been in my family. I'm trying to renounce every demon that is in my family. Like you give up everything you stole from my family. My, uh, me being from Mississippi, there's a lot of stories. Uh, people from Mississippi, we have a lot of stories of racism, especially our uh, ancestors. They can tell you some hor horrible stories, some horror stories, horror stories, uh, horrible horror. Yeah, but they can tell you some horror stories. My uh, mother told me she's been she had been telling me this for years before she passed. My family has a lawsuit. Uh, I don't know who who it goes to though. Um, but my family on my mother's side they have a lawsuit against um, a white family down in Mississippi. So what happened was my mom told me about it, and my mom was named on the lawsuit, but she was kind of distant, which meant that she wouldn't get that much. Um, if it, it has been pending for like so many years, it's been pending for more than a decade. Um, and so there is this property that belonged to my family um, and it, it uh, neighbored another property that I guess belonged to some whites. What have you? Well, the, the, fa the property that belonged to my family, maybe 30 years ago. No, it was more than 30 years ago. It was a long time ago. But the property, you know, they, they had the deeds and everything to prove that that's my family's land. They found oil on that land. And this was during a time of racial disparity and all that. Um, and so the whites took that land from my family. And they were like, oh, no, this is our land or what have you. And they couldn't do anything about it because, you know, it was extreme racism. It was Mississippi. It was during a time when they were lynching blacks like crazy. Um, so they couldn't do anything about it or what have you. And so the, the whites have been living there and they've been rich off of that oil. And so my family, you know, they have a lawsuit against them. But that lawsuit has been pending for like my mom said it's been pending for a long, long, long time. Um, but it had like the the lawyers that were on it, they were quitting. It was a whole lot of stuff. You go to Mississippi, they got some stories. You know, you would be amazed um, at some of the stuff that you see in Mississippi. Oh, yes. It, it, Mississippi is amazing. It, it's silly. But you'd be amazed at what you see. And just the stories. You, If you sit down with an old person in Mississippi, an elderly, an elderly person, that's a man. I, I, I say this, and I'm gonna challenge y'all. I want to challenge y'all. I want to give every last person on here a challenge, even those of you who watch the replay. Talk to some of these older people, get their stories, and publish them in a book or an article. Don't let their stories die with them. History repeats itself because we don't know what happened in history, we only know what has been published. Get those stories from those people before they pass away. Ask some questions. I've been doing that, you know, and I'm believing God for my dad to live a long time. But I do that with my dad. I'd be asking all types of questions. I've learned a lot about my family. Just by asking my dad a lot of questions like, okay, so, you know, what happened to such and such? Where have you? Ask questions. Ask questions. Educate yourself. Educate yourself. Don't just sit there and allow those stories to die with them. My father is buried in Louisiana and cemetery is segregated. Oh man. That's the South. That's the South. That's the South. That's the South. We got so much bloodshed guys. And it's, it's time for us. It's time for us to not for us to be the voices, you know, of, of love for God. It's time for us to call this crap out and say, I won't accept it. I'll say this real quick. And then I'll, I'll move on my, um, my mom, she used to work at a restaurant. Now, I'm from Mississippi, and there was this restaurant my mom was working at, extremely racist. My mom worked there most of my childhood. You know, um, she worked at Matt Gray's, but the restaurant was her second job. And they accept racism. A lot of the older people in Mississippi, they accept it. They, they accept it because they, a lot of times, are really poor. Mississippi's the poorest state. On top of it being a poorest state, 
Uh, a lot of them are really poor. They, their families didn't, you know, couldn't afford this in the school. They didn't go to college or what have you, or they didn't finish college. Um, so whenever they're working at jobs, they accept a lot of racism and they can't say anything about it um, because they're out of fear of being terminated. You'd be amazed. And um, one of the things I started doing, like with my mom, when she was working, I was like, tell me the stories and I got you. I'll publish it. I I'm going to come against them. So one of the restaurants my mom worked at, um, they kept all the blacks in the back. The blacks had to cook. The blacks could only work as cooks. They kept them in the back. This was to, in the 20th century, 21st century, guys. The blacks were working, and I'm pretty sure they're still like that. The blacks working in the back. The whites worked in the front. The works the whites worked as mate uh waitresses and stuff like that, waiters and waitresses. The blacks were in the back. And I've been in Mississippi, I've been in restaurants in Mississippi that were like that. You would never see a black face. When you go sit in there, you only see whites, but the blacks work in the back. It's like that in Mississippi. It's a lot of racism down there. Um, I had another another story that was popping up in my head and it's trying to escape. But it, racism is so common in uh Mississippi. Oh, my mom had started working for, um, she became a CNA and she was working for this nursing home. And um, the lady that was the manager of the nursing home was really racist. She was an older woman. She was really ra older white woman. She was really ra racist. And my mom said she told all of the CNAs, and this is what, uh, when Obama was, right before he was getting elected. And she told him, and she, she told him, y'all better not go uh, vote for Obama if he gets elected. I'm firing everybody. She told my mom and them that if he gets selected, I'm firing everybody. And uh, my mom, you know, she came and I was like, no, y'all don't have to accept it. But I was like, you know, you you know, she can get fired for that. You know, this can happen to her. You know, not just fired. That woman can be arrested. That's a civil rights lawsuit. And um, my mom was like, yeah, but, you know, that's just common. And they have to accept it down there. Well, they feel like they have to accept it. I'm, I'm going to challenge you. Reach out to people in Mississippi, in Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Georgia. Reach out to some of those older people. Reach out. Y'all, start doing something about it. Don't just talk about racism. Don't just post about racism. Do something about it. Reach out to them, those that are afraid. Talk to them. If you got an auntie who say, yeah, I work at this restaurant, but you know, we work in the back, write an article and put them on blast. You ain't got to tell them it's your aunt. You ain't got to put your you ain't got to put our job in jeopardy. Put them on blast. Call civil rights. Do something about it. Don't just talk about it. That's our problem. We protest. We sit up and post on social media, but we don't do nothing about it. We don't do nothing about it. Well, we, we just talk. We don't do anything. Call some of these people. When I'm finished with this video, take it and share it. Tag some folks. Call some of these folks, especially the older ones. They're afraid to say stuff because they're poor as it is and they're afraid to lose their jobs. So they, they get called nigga. They get called out of their name. They have no choice, but they feel like they have no choice but to tolerate it because they're afraid that if they say anything, they're going to get terminated or even worse. But I ain't scared. You not. You shouldn't be scared. You see something, write an article. You call the right, write an article. You call the right, write an article. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you guys a challenge. I want to give you a challenge for everybody. Anointed Fire Magazine's new edition comes out on June 21st. Thank you for everybody who supported the magazine thus far. If you reach out to a relative of yours, and I'm giving you a challenge. And you get their story of racism or you deal with racism any type of way. You write a nice article about 1,500 words or less. And you send it to me at info at anointed fire. I'll type the email address right here. You send it to me. I'll publish it in the magazine. I'm going to give you tea. We're going to do something about it. I'm not here just to talk. Oh, God. Okay, let me type it again. I, I forgot to come. I just put dot um, not dot com. Can it be about ourselves? Eh, 
Yeah, but I, I, yeah, say something about yourself. But I want you to. I want to challenge you to reach outside of yourself as well, because I want people to. Yeah, in the name of Jesus, I bind every spirit that's in Peoria that would try to start um, any type of destruction, murder, any bloodshed in Jesus' name. Uh, but I want you guys to. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge everybody on here, white and black. Um, Latino, Asian, whatever. I want to challenge you to reach out to some people in your family. Get their story. And I, I want to challenge you to take action. Take an action. And send it to me. 1,500 words or less. Send it to me. Info at anointedfire.com. You send it out. I publish it in Anointed Fire Magazine. New edition. It comes out on June 21st. You send it. I will Right. And that's the thing. It, you know, the people that use it as an excuse to steal, they are, you, you're going to have thieves that use that as cover. And unfortunately, the only way to deal with that is for peaceful protest, um, protesters to not allow themselves to get amped up, but to also start to stop it, to, to stand against that. Um, but. Okay, we already got a troll. Let me see. Let's go here. All right. But we you already have um sorry. Right, and you have people that are actually destroying businesses. And let me oh let me say this. Let me say this. And I know I was gonna tell deal with race uh, relationships. It's something I want to deal with about jealousy. I'll probably do a whole other message for that. I think I'm probably gonna go out and do a whole other message for that. Um when it comes to us destroying black businesses or destroying businesses, how does that help us? It doesn't, guys. It doesn't. You know, I love what my pastor said. He said, I don't um, condone it, but I don't condemn it because you can't tell people how to bleed. Nevertheless, um, yeah, and it triggers a lot of hurt in a lot of people. I'm sorry to hear about your father. It triggers a lot of hurt in a lot of people. A lot of us have dealt with some type of pain. Um, and, you know, we dealt with that type of pain or some, you know, somebody dying in our family and the enemy is trying to rip off that wound, that, that, that scab because he has an idea for the black race. He wants to kill off as many people as he can, you know, blacks and whites and what have you. Um, he doesn't want unity because unity renders him powerless. Unity renders him powerless. Um, so what the enemy wants to do is he wants us uh, to fight against each other. But I, I want to go ahead and say this. As far as the whole tearing down stuff and destroying stuff, that's not helping anybody. It's putting people out of work. We're destroying our economy, guys. And it's like we, we, we have to stop being emotional. Honestly, we got to stop being emotional. Logical wins. Logic wins over emotion. Logic wins over emotion any day. Logic wins over emotion any day. Why do you think that a man can walk out of a relationship and a woman absolutely loses her mind and she's doing all types of stuff to hurt him? Why do you think that happens? Because men are typically logical. Women are usually emotional. Logic wins on any on any day. When you're logical, you you have the power in that situation. If I'm having a discussion or an argument with a, 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 an emotional person and I remain logical, I've won. Even if that person has a point, I've won. Because I can just shrug it off and be like, you know what? And the Bible says it this way. Even a foolish man seems wise when he holds his peace. You know, and so... If I just sit there and be like, oh, well, you know, I seem logical in that moment. A property is loot. Agree with the looting of unbelievers. Yeah, and I, I don't agree with it, but I agree with what my pastor said. He said, I don't condone it. Um, I don't condone it. You know, the, well, the not the looting. Uh, he was talking about the, you know, breaking stuff. When you're dealing with unbelievers, unbelievers are going to act as unbelievers. And I think a lot of times as the church will look at unbelievers and we'll expect them to act um logically or uh we'll expect them to act you know like we act you dealing with somebody who has that void there's no substance there and all they know how to do is violence you know or or you know to steal or something like that um and then you push that button on them they're gonna come out and they're gonna do what they know how to do that's all they're gonna do and so what we have to do is we have to stop looking at people as Oh, you know, this person is bad. Sometimes you just got to say they're uneducated. 
they're uneducated. Um, or, you know, this person just doesn't know any better. And then you can look at some people and say, now, he's bad. She's bad. A person I consider to be bad, for example, is somebody who's in church, who studied the word of God, and yet still they treat people like crap. That's the person that's bad because they know better. That that person is bad because they know better. A child out doing stupid stuff because they don't know it, he's not necessarily bad. He's ignorant. He just don't know. Or what have you. Now, racism, um, in most cases, is bad. Because it, it deals with a level of ignorance, of course. Um, the racist it doesn't know, you know, don't want to be around blacks, what have you. But while it, where it becomes bad is that they know that it's wrong. Nobody, nobody walks around thinking that it's okay to kill folks. There is something in you that's going to tell you that's not okay. Nevertheless, it's what they've been taught. Um, and then at the same time, you know, when you surround yourself with a bunch of racist people who are murderers and stuff like that, and you're accepting and you deal with rejection you're probably going to keep doing what you're doing or what have you. And so, yeah, it's being taught. It's being taught. And so what has to happen is um, education. What has to happen is education. So if you have kids, put your children around kids of different races. I love what my mom did with us. She threw us around kids of different races. I remember when I was uh, maybe 17. No, I had. A, I think I had a car by then. I don't remember. No, I didn't have a car. So I was about 16, 16 to 17. But I remember... My mom volunteered me to babysit, you know, one of her co-workers' children. It was a white lady. I babysit her, her sons or what have you. She had two sons and a daughter. And this ain't a race thing, but she had the baddest kids I had ever can. Ah, Jesus. Them kids were terrible. They had pocket knives. They were hiding in box. I was like, what in the world? I came home. I was like, I'm not babysitting her kids no more. My mom said, no, I've already volunteered you. She's paying you. I remember she's paying me fifteen dollars to babysit her kids. I was like, "Mom, them kids are terrible." The little boy, I couldn't find him. I'm running around the house looking for him. Like, and then he popped out of the box with a pocket knife. Ha! I was like, "What in the world?" You know? I was like, "Boy, listen, I'm gonna beat you down." Uh, but I, I'm thankful for the experience because my mom, you know, she pushed us to be around people who didn't look like us. You know. She had a greater vision for us than for us to fit in. Oh, Jesus, this is a big old black ant. When I tell you Georgia ants look like cats and dogs. Okay. But my mom pushed us to be around uh, people who didn't look like ourselves. You know, she had people that, come over, that came over to our house that didn't look like us. You know, we had blacks coming to our house. We had whites coming to our house, you know. So we were always around just different races or what have you. I won't say, I mean, we were mostly around blacks because, you know, but we had whites around us. My mom had white friends. We went to the white friend's house and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that because it taught me a lot. And at the same time, it helped me to see, and I can speak to racism in white people. I can speak to racism in black people. I can tell you, I can, I can sit around a white person and tell them, I can see your racism. I can show you where your racism at. I can show you what you do right there, that's racism. And I can do that with a black person as well. I'm like, sis, that's racism. Right there, ignorance, ignorant statements, that's racism. You know, um, I'm, I'm going to get ready to close on this and I'm going to open it back up for those of you who want to come back in. I'm going to deal with uh, the topic of jealousy. And I'm probably not going to stay there very long because, but I don't want to do a whole video for four or five hours. But, um, Ignorant statements are racism. Ignorance is racism. So I'll give you an example. When I didn't know any better, when I first met my ex, you know, from Cameroon, who's from Cameroon, when I first met him, one of the questions I asked him, is it true that uh, the people in Africa, y'all, like y'all, y'all be sitting on the ground, you ain't got nowhere to sit? I was straight ignorant. You know, and while that's not racism, that is a form of ignorance. And I don't know what kind of ism that is. Not necessarily classism. I don't know what which ism that is. Somebody can, um, but yeah, it it was. I don't remember what it, um, but I just remember, you know, I was like I had a lot of ignorance in regards to Africa because I had I've been in Mississippi my whole life. I hadn't been anywhere, and um, it was just ignorance on my part, you know. And so, long story short, um. I learned a lot from being around Africans. And like I said, it opened up my heart and my eyes uh, to love people. 
you know, and not just um, Africans. I lived in Germany, so it opened my heart and my eyes to love people of different races, cultures, or uh, what have you. And ignorance is dealt with through information. It's dealt with you you getting past the discomfort of being around people um, who, you, who you don't agree with. Because you get around cultures, you're not going to agree with them. I and you don't have to force yourself to agree. I don't agree with a lot of things that Cameroonians do or what they believe. I didn't agree. You know, um, a lot of things I agree with, but I didn't agree like culturally, the like family, you know, and just like they didn't necessarily agree with me. When it comes to family, I'm, you know, Americans, we have our beliefs like, hey, I love you, but <laughs> your house over there and you better call before you come to my house. Cameroonian culture is not necessarily like that. Well, that's what he told me. Yeah, I could be wrong. So if I'm wrong, y'all forgive me. That may be ignorance on my part. But um, a lot of times with Cameroonians, and I think he was telling me, you know, a lot of Africans, they don't believe in, they ain't going to call you and tell you they're on their way to your house. They're just going to show up. They're just going to show up at your house and you're supposed to open the door and you could be in the kitchen cooking for you and your family. Like if it's me and if I was married to, you know, a, a guy from that country and I had three kids and I cooked just enough food for us to sit down and eat. And then all of a sudden you hear. And I look out the window and I see somebody from Cameroon stand. Hello. I'm supposed to open a door. And I, I got to go back to the kitchen and cook some more. I got to give up my plate. I got to give up my plate. No, you, you see me still looking at it. Georgia insects don't die easy. I sprayed, I caught, uh, it was a jumping spider. Um, I had to get a new monitor and I got a jumping spider. Um, he jumped off of the thing. And when he hit the floor, his sound, you can hear his body. And I sprayed that thing. It took him like 15, I, I sprayed him with spider spray, specialized spider spray. It took him 15 minutes to die. And this ant over here, he rolling around. He ain't dead yet. He in a ball, but he kicking and moving and all that stuff. He, yeah, he's doing all that. All right, so I'm going to get ready to end it there. Yeah, I sprayed him with, it's called spider and, spider and scorpion spray. And that thing there, I sprayed him. He was walking around like he ain't been sprayed. I think he got high. I think he got high. You know, he got turned on. He was looking at me like, yo, 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 you know who I am? It took him, it took him a while. I went into the kitchen, started washing the dishes. Came back, he was still living. I was like, this Georgia thing? I don't know what they got in the food and the water out here. Yeah, Mississippi, the insects over there. And the mosquito Mississippi mosquitoes will make you believe in God. Mississippi mosquitoes will make you, they will make you get saved. You if you have not been in Mississippi, Mississippi mosquitoes will make you get saved. Because they they don't respect you. They bite the crap out of you. Them some. You know, here I barely can see the mosquitoes, but Mississippi, that if you ain't saved, the mosquitoes make you get saved. You'll give your life to the Lord after you start getting bit by Mississippi, Mississippi mosquitoes. You'll give your life over to Christ. All right, guys. Now I'm gonna close out of here and um I'm gonna open up another one. The reason is I don't want this to be super, super long. And then two, a lot of people won't necessarily come in here because of the title, which is stupid and crazy, but it's the reality of the human race. Um but when we deal with relationships, we deal with a whole other topic. People will typically come in. I promise you, I'm not going to keep you long because I'm hungry. So I'm, I'm probably going to do this one for 30 minutes to, I'm going to try not to go an hour, um, but I'm going to do a real quick discussion because I had a sister in Christ to ask me a question about jealousy. And I promised her that I was going to answer it on the next one, but I just don't, I feel like this one, I just kind of need to um, close this out and then I'm going to start another one. So give it two minutes less than two minutes matter of fact i'm gonna close this out and then i'm gonna come back in and i'm gonna do another one make sure that you log on do me a favor do me a huge favor make sure that you share this please 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 make sure you share this on social media i believe this is the discussion that we need to have and i believe that uh, we all need to learn how to love each other and i want to let y'all know that to my white sisters to my black Sisters to my um, Asian sisters to my uh, to my um, Latino sisters and brothers, all of you guys, I love all y'all. I love y'all, and I love you with the love of Christ. And I want to see us um, come together. I do. I want to see us come together and love on each other. Y'all see my nails are horrible right now, but I want to. Uh, I want to see us come together 
and love on each other and, and stand up against injustice, stand up against racism. You know, not just be sitting up here thinking that just because we are of a certain race that we have to suddenly take the side of that race. You know, um, no, who are my mother and my brothers? Those who do the will of God. So I love y'all. Do me a favor. We're going to deal with jealousy and we're going to deal with relationships on the next one. So I'm about to end this and I'm about to come back in. I want you to come into that one and I will answer questions in that. So I'm going to probably teach for like 10 to 15 minutes. I just want to answer this sister in Christ question um, that I promised her that I was going to answer. I want to answer her question. I thought I told her it was something I would really love to talk on. Uh, I want to answer her question and then I will open it up for questions and then I'm going to get off of there. Um, so come back in because we have um, 51 people in right now. Uh, some of these people are not going to come back because they're just, they'll use this as an excuse. Um, so come in, you'll get your question answered. All right. And lastly, I knew it was something I was kind of tearing for. Um, for those of you who are authors, those of you who are authors or you are wanting to write a book, I have my book, Microscribology. And matter of fact, I'm going to bring it down before I launch the next one. I'm going to bring it down and I'll talk to you guys about Microscribology. I'm going to do a virtual book signing of that. I've had those books in my car for uh, since I released that book. And I was going to do a book signing and I never got around to it. That thing, that's, he still ain't dead. But um, I never got around to it. And it's a very, very thick book. So I want to do a virtual book signing and I want to ship it to you guys. I think that right now is the perfect time for many of you to start writing. Even if you're not writing for yourself, like I told you, call those relatives who got the story. Y'all, y'all don't even know. Call that old grandma, that old auntie that you don't like talking to. Get them stories before they pass. Don't let them take those stories to the grave with them. And I'm not just talking about stories of racism and stuff like that. They may have stories of victory. They're, they got beautiful stories. Get that stuff. Publish it. Listen, call them up. You can download an app. I don't know the name of apps, but there are apps in the app store um, that you can record calls. You can call them and say, hey, grandma, or hey, auntie, hey, cousin, or whatever. I want to record this call because I want to transcribe it. I want to publish it. I want to write a book for you, or I want to include that in my book. You know, if you include it in your book, make sure you give them credit. Make sure you give them some money from it, uh, or what have you. Calling it these stories, guys. I mean, and I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking to um, blacks, to the whites. Call. Say, hey, whatever happened? Yeah, we had this. Get those stories. We, we're, we're throwing away a whole lot of history um, because we are entitled and we're scrolling social media. We're just like... You're scrolling our lives away. So meet me in two minutes. I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to go get my book, Microscribology, and then I'm coming back on and we're going to deal with the topic of jealousy and we may talk a little bit about sex. All right. Love y'all. Two minutes. Two minutes. Make sure you come back in. Make sure you, and hey, sew into this, guys. You always know. Make sure you sew into it. All right. Be right back.